Hello, this section is entitled Storage, Understand Kubernetes Storage Objects. So the first thing, um, this script borrows heavily from uh, an article, two articles I wrote on storage, um, and the link is in the script. And the article is called Kubernetes Storage by Example, part one and two. So I'm gonna be flipping back and forth between my script and that. So um, the first concept about storage in general is um, our containers we've been running. If you recall, we actually can save things to like the disk, right? You know, without doing anything special. And what you're writing to is essentially what's called the uh, container uh, writable layer. And it's, it's really intended for just, just for the container, just for temporary files. Uh, there's no persistence. It doesn't, you know, the container gets restarted, it goes away, um, but it does exist and you can use it for just temporary files. Um, you don't want to think about persisting anything there and you don't want to think about anything particularly large. Okay, so that's it for that. Um, okay, so the next concept is kind of in the same vein, you can create a pod level temporary you know, folder, uh, or not folder, well, basically a disk, right? That you can share across your pods, right? Um, this is, it's basically the same intent it's meant for temporary files. You don't want to think about it as being permanent. You don't want to store a ton of stuff there. It's just a quick way to share data between, pod, between containers in the same pod. And um, one of the, well, I'll just probably do it by example, but um, one of the things you can create, was, which is called an empty dir, right? And that basically just borrows disk space off of the, the node, and w which is empty, and then makes it available to the, the pod. So I think the easiest way of looking at this is by example. So we have an example of this. It's um, empty dir. So let me go into our project. And apparently I'm not in the right folder. I'm in 22, I believe. Storage objects. Okay, so let's look at this first before we run it. Um, so empty dir, uh, it's just got a single pod. And um, in this case, this pod has two containers, Ubuntu A and Ubuntu B, right? Um, and, and sort of introducing this kind of, this is like kind of the simplest example of this pattern. And then at the pod level, you define volumes. And that's essentially defining at the pod level what volumes or you know, basically folders are available for the, um, the containers to use. In this case, I'm defining a volume named cache. And this format empty dir with the empty here is just a way of indicating that um, it's gonna use the empty, D, empty dir uh, mechanism to create essentially an empty directory. And then the key for that is once you have a volume at the pod level, then you need to mount that same volume into the containers themselves. So you'll notice I'm doing a volume mount. This cache here refers to this cache here. And then I'm just happen to name the folder that it mounts to slash cache, just for, just for no good reason, but other than it was easy to remember. So the idea here is um, there's two steps of the process. One is at the pod level, and then you gotta mount them into the containers, right? And that's pretty much the pattern. So let's go ahead and just validate this actually works. Um, I think I started my nodes up. Yep. Okay, and then I make sure nothing's running. I say kube control get all. Yep, I didn't leave anything in there. Okay, so if I do helm install dev empty dir. Okay. Get all, make sure it's up and running. Okay, it's not ready yet. Not ready yet. Okay, it's running now. Okay, so I've got my container running. It's got two, I've got my pod running and there's two containers in it, right? And I'm just gonna copy these commands out of here just to save myself. Um, let's see, what am I doing here? Oh. Oh, 
Oh, okay. Actually, let's go back to my article. So, da, 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 da. oh, here we go. Okay, so basically, let me copy and paste this in, and, and then we'll walk you through what this is about. So here I'm just running, uh, executing into the empty dir. Um, this is the name of the um, pod. Um, and then I'm doing container A. Oh, this is, this is left over from, mm, I think I called it Ubuntu A. And then I'm echoing a hello world into the cache folder to a text file there. Uh, this is, I, I changed names on things, so hang on. What did I name this thing? So this is named, okay, example. So I changed names from the article. So the pod is example, container is Ubuntu A, this should work. Okay, so that just wrote a file to a folder called slash cache. And the interesting thing here is I can then um, cat that file just from, so I'm just gonna cat it. So let me just up here. I'm gonna do container Ubuntu B, right? And I'm just gonna run, I believe I can just run, make it simple, cat cache. Hello, I think that should work. Yeah, so that's just illustrating again that both containers are sharing the same essentially volume and they're just mapping it, it right. And they have to be mapped into the same relative path, each of them, the, I, they don't have to be the slash cache. One could be slash cache A and one could be slash cache B. The point is that they share the same volume. Okay, um, that's really not much there. Helm uninstall dev. Okay, so that's the example of sort of a temporary, using the center of you can kind of create a temporary folder to share between containers in the pod. Now, one thing you can also do is you can, instead of having that using empty dir, you, there's a whole number, there's a whole bunch of different um, drivers, right, that you can use to um, connect that, that pod to a volume. Right? One of which, for example, is you can actually use Amazon's Elastic Block Store. And then you can map that into your pod. And then you can then, in your containers, you can, you know, you can, you can connect to them. Right? Or you can uh, mount them. Um, now, so what we're going to do is we're going to use actually use in our example is the, the article here uses something different because it was local. But I'm going to actually use an Amazon, um, an Amazon EBS volume. So first I want to do is describe the node real quick. See, um, you'll, this will make sense in a second. So I'll say kube, describe. I only run, I'm only, run, only run, running one node right now. Oh. Kube control describe node. Okay, so the node right now is running, um, what I'm looking at here, I'm trying to look at the, here it is. In the labels, um, you'll notice that it tells us what zone, this is an Amazon thing, right? What Amazon zone this node's running in. Um, and, it, and I'm gonna notice it's US East 1B. The reason why that's important is I need to actually pre, uh, create my, let me go into my EC2. I need to create my EBS volume that I'm gonna use, right? Um, and so I go to volumes and I actually have one right here ready to go. I was I actually did this earlier. So all you do is you just say create volume, right? Uh, you basically pick the zone right here, right? And it's basically hit. So I did, that's all you do. So here's the volume right here that I want to use. It's a hundred gigabyte volume, right? I pick up the name of the volume ID here. And what I'm going to do now is, um, now the, I guess what I didn't make clear here is that We'll, we'll deal with this later, but in this particular case, uh, my I know my node is running in on um, a US East one uh, B one B, which and that means I needed to, I needed to create that EBS volume in ES one uh, ES um, US East one B also, otherwise this wouldn't work. So and again, we'll do something later to 
make this more automated, but we're just doing it manually now. So I need to go into persistent. Actually, I just need to go to edit this stuff. Okay, I'm going to go into persistent and close this down. I'm going to persistent. I'm going to go to my templates and look at my pod. So here, so I'm, here's a look at what we're doing here. Volumes, right? Um, I just happen to call data, right? But I'm now using the driver or whatever this is called, um, called for the AWS Elastic Block Store. And then you basically what you have to do is you have to tell it what volume. So I just copied that volume. And then you have to tell it what kind of file system it's going to mount, use to mount into your container. So that's that's the documentation. That's the default type, the recommended type. Um, and then you can see I'm mounting that same volume onto this Ubuntu into the slash data folder. Right? And one thing you get back in your mind, if you know anything about EBS, you really, I'm pretty sure you can only mount this into one container um, because EBS volumes are really designed to be only mounted. They're not like a multi, um, they're not designed for multiple use, right? They're designed for one host running it. Okay, so that's why I only have one container here. Um, I think this is ready to go. So what I'm going to do is just to illustrate this. Helm install dev um, persistent. Now, I'm going to, while this is doing this, I'm going to distinguish. We're going to talk about persistent volumes, which is a different thing. We're, we just happen to be a volume that happens to be persistent. That's different than a persistent volume, just a point of clarity. Um, speed, control, get all. I think what I want to do is I want to connect to it. Okay, group control XX, uh, example. Okay, and I'm pretty sure if I run disk free, I will notice if it's working right, and of course it probably is not working right. Oh, there it is, it is working right. So I'll see here, This see the data here? This data now is actually 100 gigabyte, I think if I do data, data free minus human, um, it will now tell me the size of it. So it's there's your 100 gig, essentially, mapped to uh, slash data. So that's pretty much all there is to that. Um, make sure I didn't miss anything else. So this was an example of, of a pod just directly connecting to a volume and then being using it in a container. Okay, so yep, that's all I want to do. Okay, so let me take this one out of service. Exit, Helm, uninstall dev. Okay, so so far we've been operating sort of directly um, having the pods themselves directly, can, you know, we're trying to do both sides of the equation. We're creating the Elastic B, uh, EBS instance uh, as a developer. We're going there, creating it, and then we're directly mapping it into the pod. and so one of the things that, that um, let me pause the video and make sure I get myself oriented here. Hang on. Okay, I'm back. Yeah, I just realized I, I wanted to go down and talk about some things first. So let me scroll to the next article. I'm trying to, I'm trying to set the motivation for this next section. So, um, so in the previous example, right, we, we actually did sort of two op two kinds of operations. And technically we were wearing two um, hats or responsibilities while we're doing it, right? On one hand, this is a little different by the way in the article because this was a different example, but in, one, in, in the example we just did, one operation was to create, go into uh, a, uh, uh, AWS and create the EBS volume, right? And get and, and obtain that volume ID, right? So that I would call that an infrastructure task. That's something that your like your system operator people would be doing, right? Allocating disk drive, and then the, the other part of the task was actually creating the pod that used that num that name, right? And the, the part of the problem here is there was like a tight coupling between those two steps, and that's the name of that volume. I had to copy and paste that volume name between people, right? And so that's a little bit of a workflow problem where you may have to have you know, one team wait for another team, um, and it would be nice if one team could do their work in advance, 
and give you know not did not have to email you like the volume name right so that's what we're going to do here is sort of create a mechanism to separate out the two operations right um, and so the way we do this is essentially uh, one team the infrastructure team will create what's called persistent volume there's a couple of flavors of this but this is going to be the static case where they're going to create a persistent volume right they're going to um, basically set it up in Kubernetes, tie it back to the actual volume, the backing volume, which is the, the Elastic Block Store, EBS um, instance, right? And then they'll leave it there, and developer will come in not knowing you know, the details of like the volume name or anything, be able to then uh, write code that will consume that persistent volume, and then they get to map it into their pod, right? And in a very um, declarative way. They don't have to share that volume ID essentially, and then what? So the difference here is the one group would be creating persistent volumes, and the other group is going to create the persistent volume claim. That's the consumption of the persistent volume. Um, yeah. So I think I, okay. So I think the best way of doing this is by example. Um, so I think let's switch gears. Let me go back here. Um, Right, so I mentioned this is an example of static provisioning, right? Now, so one thing, uh, yeah, let's go look at the example and I'm gonna, come, I'm gonna bounce back and forth. Okay, so the first thing I do is look at the example here. So this example is called persistent volume, right? Under templates, so now of course I just did this all in one, like one application here, but conceptually you have sort of two minds here. You have one group that's creating this persistent volume Right? And if you look at this, this looks somewhat similar to what we just did, right? Because this has got the hard-coded volume name in here. Matter of fact, I think I need to switch this volume name. Let's see if I still have it. I do have it. Okay, so imagine you're the administrator, right? And you're going to create this persistent volume. Um, let's, we'll talk about this access mode in a minute. Here. Um, I'm basically declaring that this is 100 gigabytes of space. This is, this is so that the the developers who are consuming this will be able to, you know, when they ask for 100 gigs of disk space, this will this will this will match their request, right? So this is basically defining um, not so much the, the actual size of it; it's just the it's like the advertised size of this persistent volume into the cluster, okay? Um, and then this this bottom part should look clear. This is basically telling it. Hey, this this is going to be made available by this volume. This is the backing volume, right? Um, that's in AWS, right? Now, the the key here, there's two things you want to talk about. One is the storage class name, and then one is the access mode. So the first is the storage class name. That is essentially how it's being advertised into the cluster. So when developers want to use this, they're going to ask for essentially uh, for storage that is 100 gigabytes or less, and they'll ask for a storage class name of development. And if this persistent volume is is available and not already consumed, they'll get they'll basically grab a hold of this thing. They did not need to know that this was backed by AWS. They didn't need to know that there was a volume ID of this. Right. All they needed to know was development, um, and the storage was 100 gigabytes. And actually, they actually. They also need to know actually that that they want it as a read write once volume right so let's talk about what this read write once business is about um, so let's go back into here okay so there are different access modes to volume so when you request access to a volume or you make it available to others right depending on what you're doing right um, there's three modes that that volume could be in one is read write once that basically means it's read writable but it can only be used by one container, essentially. That's kind of the EBS example, right? You can't have multiple EBS containers, um, multiple containers using the same EBS volume. Um, read only many is pretty much clear now. It's read only, but many people can consume it. Many containers can consume it. And read write many is, it's read write and many containers can consume it. Uh, the only example we're going to be using now is read write once, since that's the only thing that EBS supports, right? Um, right. So now let's look at now the other half of this equation here. So I showed you 
what the admin was doing, but let's look to see what the developer is going to do. They're going to create now a claim, right? This is where they're at. They're, they're basically now developing their application. It says, oh, I need some disk space. And I was told that um, the three pieces of information that they need to share is, one, they need to tell it, okay, this needs to be accessed as read write once. So that's the kind of volume, that's the type of volume I'm looking for. I need 100 gigs of space. They could have asked for anything less than 100 gigs. Then this will work. If they asked for more than 100 gigs, this would not work because the, the volume was, was advertised as 100 gigs or you know, as 100 gigs, so you can't ask for more than that one. And then I gave it a storage class name of development, and that's what's going to tie this claim request back into that volume, right? And then now that that's all in place, now on my pod, right? Now I say, oh, I just need to use my claim. So the, the volume I'm mapping here is now, I'm pointing at my claim and the name of the claim, right? And so the whole point of this exercise, again, is to break up the responsibility of, of provisioning these volumes. One is, I can't say enough times, but one is by the sysops person who knows the specifics of how, the, how this volume is being delivered, right? They know it's AWS and they know the volume type. And then you have a developer person who really doesn't care about those details. All they want to know is I have a read, write, read all they want to know is that it's read, write, one's volume, it's this big, and, with, and then they're told by their you know, sysops people to look for it with a storage class name of development, right? And then, they, then that's how they map it into their pods with no knowledge of AWS or anything. Okay, long story short, let's see how this works. So if I go, um, if I could do this right, I think I should be, should be able to do Helm, install, dev persistent volume. All right, this should do it. Somehow I think I'm missing something, but we'll find out. And if I do clean, control, get all. Okay, it's running, that's good news. Um, so we'll look at a couple things here. Kube control, get PV. So that's the persistent volume itself, right? And here's the data on it. Um, we'll talk about this reclaim policy in a bit. Um, it might be in the, well, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll talk about it shortly. Um, actually, we'll probably look at it in a minute. Um, but the key other one is this bound, right? This bound means now that this, this um, if I had only run part of this, um, what would have happened is this um, wouldn't have been bound yet until the claim came along. That's when it gets turns into being bound. Before that, I think it's like available, right? And then it's bound, and this tells you the claim that actually, and that's the name of the claim that's taking it, right? Um, so basically, this basically means it's being used, right? If I look at the PVC, I can see that um, it's also bound, right? Here, and it basically says it's all ready to go. Now, let me see if I want to so make sure I'm not missing something. All right, so look at that. Okay, we just want to validate. Okay, so this log, well, I don't really need to do it. If I log into the container, I'm going to see the volume, and it's pretty much you know, what I expect. So I, I did want to talk about, yeah, so the next thing I want to talk about, what was, so one thing we did, we looked at that uh, kube control get PV. So there's this re retain, right? So there's actually three options for, what is this thing called? It's called the reclaim policy, right? There's three, there's three modes. One is called retain, right? And that's the default, right? If you don't specify otherwise. And what that basically means is once, let's say I delete, and we'll go, I think we'll go through an example here real quickly. If I delete the pod, delete the claim, right? Then that the persistent volume that was created, you know, it's kind of just free floating. In this case, it's gonna go into like a, like used, I mean, it's basically gonna go into a status where it needs to be, it needs to be managed by the system administrator. It can't be reused again. 
It's not automatically uh, made available again, and it's not automatically deleted, essentially. So it's just kind of in a mode where the sysadmin needs to decide what they're going to do with it. They're going to either delete it, they're going to you know, wipe out the directory and make it available again. There's lots of things they can do. So that's what the retain means, is it's retaining it for manual processing or reclamation. Recycled means it's going to automatically, once the, the claim gets um, deleted, then it can be recycled immediately, the directory gets wiped out, and it's made available for the next developer. That's not supported by AWEDS, but that's one, some of them do support that concept. And uh, one is deleted, that is, once you, um, the claim is gone, the, the vo backing volume is immediately deleted. Right? Now, deleting the volume in this case doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to, um, right. Oh, actually, I take it back. Okay, I'm, I'm wrong about this. So it does say deleting removes both the persistent volume object from the Kubernetes as well as associated storage asset and external infrastructure. So in this case, when you, when you set to delete, it's going to delete both the volume, right, and it's going to delete also the backing EBS volume too, right? And we'll see, actually we'll see that shortly too. Okay, so to, to sort of illustrate this, it's in the retain status right now. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna delete the PV pod and PVC, and then we're gonna poke around, right? Um, so let's do this here. So right now it's bound, right? So let's do this, let's um, get all. Um, control. Delete pod example. Okay, um, that gets rid of the pod, but the claim is still hanging around. So as long as the claim's around, by the way, I can re go. I'm not going to do it, but uh, if as long as the claim's there, I can now reconnect, create another pod, reconnect it back to the claim, and everything's back to normal. The, the data's still there; um, it's not gone. Um, so I'm not going to do it, but you could do that. I could recreate this pod, and everything's back to where it was. Um, let me. This takes like about 30 seconds. I'm going to pause the video and wait till this is done. Back. Okay. So kube control get all. So the pod's gone. Kube control get pvc. The claim should be still here. It's still bound. And in fact, you know what I'm going to do? Just to illustrate, I'm going to I'm going to re. I'm going, to do, I'm going to reinstall that pod and show you that everything kind of comes back normally. So Helm, um, oh gosh, Helm upgrade dev persistent volume. Okay, that should recreate the pod again, right? Um, and what I wanted to show you is that the pod actually does indeed come up. And the pod comes back. Um, I, I don't want to log in, but you'll, if I connect to it, I'll, st I'll see that same volume back. So um, either way, I don't, let's see, hang on. I'm just I'm curious to see. Um, I can't remember if it shows the volumes here. Oh, yeah, here it is right here. It doesn't tell you the volume here, right? So it basically tells me the volume. It's probably right here, right? Volumes. Basically, it's mounted, right? I think that's it. Okay, so point is, it's it's reconnected the volume. Okay, so let me delete the pod again. Kube control, or kube cuddle, delete pod example. Okay, um, but now I'm going to also delete the PVC, the persistent volume claim. Oh, I have to pause the video again. Darn it. Um, so I'm now I'm going to delete the PVC. Okay, so now, now that I've got rid of that, now look at the status of the persistent volume. So now it's in the status of released, right? So it was previously bound, it was released. The actual full set of options are available. That's before it gets connected up to a claim. 
Bound is it's already connected to a claim, and released is the current status where it's released to the claim, but it's not ready to be used by anyone else. And then failed is something went wrong, right, with this automatic recl uh, reclamation. So we're in the release status here, and what happens now is if it's in a release status, it cannot be used by another claim. So I can illustrate that uh, by trying to do, uh, if I do helm upgrade, Dev persistent volume. Okay, and what's going to happen is it's going to provision it, get all. Um, I'll see that my pod example is pending, and let me see if I can describe it. I should see a problem. So there's a failed scheduling. <coughs> so basically it has an unbound so basically the pod is not it doesn't have a bound persistent claim so it can't can't start right um, and so and then you can look at the cube control get pvc oops that's still stuck in but the pvc itself is there's you know it's basically it's pending control describe PVC so should say something along the lines that it can't find any volumes that match it, right? So, um, right, so it basically couldn't find, so what it's trying to do is it's trying to look for, using the storage class name of development, it's looking for some persistent volume that can provision it and or give it to it, and, and nope, it's not, not available, right? And so storage class is still just basically pending. So it's gonna be pending until now, one way of fixing this is if I go out, delete that persistent volume, recreate the persistent volume, that will now make a persistent volume of the name development available again that's in the available status, and then this claim will pick it up, the pod will start, and everything will be fine. Okay, so that's illustrating that whole concept of, of the status of a PVC. Um, or actually, status of a persistent volume to be consumed by a PVC. Okay, you see how this gets a little confusing. Um, yeah, I think we're done with that. Okay, one side note. So far, we haven't been talking about uh, namespaces. So first of all, persistent volumes themselves are not namespace, but persistent volume claims are. So when you when your PVC connects to a persistent volume, it's by that, by that storage class name, which is globally unique, you know, globally sensible, nothing to do with namespaces. But when you want to connect a pod to a PVC, it has to be done in the same namespace. And, and, and it has to be, as I said, it's namespaced and it has to be the same namespace. Okay, so the PVC and the pod have to be in the same namespace. Okay, that's it for that. Okay, Whew. okay, the next concept is Storage class. Okay, here. Where does this go? There it is. Okay, so one of the pain points of the last example we did was that the infrastructure team had to manually create that persistent volume, right? Um, and they had to do that. You know, the developer um, deletes their claim, and then now they're stuck again, and now they have to ask the infrastructure team to then create another volume for them, right? So that would be fairly tedious to always have to create volumes um, for the developers, right? It'd be nice if there was a mechanism to automatically create these volumes, EVS volumes on the fly. And it turns out there is a way of doing that. Uh, so instead of using a storage class name like we use, um, we actually create an object called the storage class with that name. And so when, instead of, it bind, instead of that PVC binding to a particular volume, it's gonna, find its way to the storage class, and the storage class is a, um, like an object, right, that knows how to create the persistent volumes on, uh, on the fly, and they'll hand it to the PVC. I think that's the general idea. Um, so I think the way we do this, I'll just do it by example again. Yeah, we're just gonna do it by example. So, um, helm, un 
Helm is still running. Yeah, I do. Helm uninstall dev. Okay, let's look at this last example. Make sure I'm not missing something in my storage class. Okay, I think we're good. Um, I do want to talk about, oh, so I guess one of the, there's two things I want to catch here. One is, this is an example of dynamic binding, right? Uh, previously we were doing like a static, like a static creation of volumes, right? This is going to be a dynamic provisioning of a volume, this is the other pattern, okay? And then the second thing is this volume binding mode, but what we'll do is I'll talk about it when we bring up the code itself. So, storage class templates. So one thing you'll notice here, I don't actually have a persistent volume defined anymore. So I have only this thing called a storage class. So this storage class is something that the, the infrastructure team would be creating now, right? They're not creating volumes, they're creating a storage class. Developer essentially does the same thing they always did, but the, the, this is changing how the infrastructure team works. So they're creating this thing called a storage class, right? And the name is a name that they're sh you know, sharing it as, right? So this is being, this is kind of like that development string that we had, but I'm just naming it something different just for. So there's a provisioner. And in this case, there's a provisioner called ebscsiaws.com, right? Which basically says, this tells it how to, that, that provisioner is code essentially that tells um, Kubernetes how to go in, go to AWS, create the, um, create the volume, right, the EBS volume, and then make it available as a, a Kubernetes volume, right? Now, I think I skimmed over one thing I just realized, is that out of the box, right, out of the box, uh, EBS, EKS, Elast EKS, uh, Elastic Kubernetes System, doesn't out of the box support it, um, but they have an article uh, at AWS how to enable it basically. So I went through the exercise. I'm not doing this on the screens, like maybe 10 steps. Um, and once you do that, then you'll be able to dynamically, um, you know, by creating this. So, but once you do the step on Amazon, you create one of these objects and anytime a developer asks for a storage class name of, in this case, EBSSC, they're gonna get um, automatically provisioned a volume that's backed by a EBS volume in your, um, in your AWS instance. Okay, so that's this. Now the one thing I didn't talk about this is this volume binding mode. So this is important because, you see it says wait for first consumer. What this basically says is don't bind, don't actually create that volume until a pod actually asks for it. Don't, you know, like if you start, by, when, the, when the claim gets created, it doesn't actually create the volume. It's only when the pod actually demands it does it actually create the volume. That's what, that's what this mode is. The, the other mode, which is, I believe, like the first, the default mode is different. It is immediate mode. It's basically, I think it's called immediate or something like that. But basically the behavior is the moment the persistent volume claim is created, then it, then it provisions a volume in um, EBS. Now the reason why this had to be set this way is because it was that whole availability zone problem. So if I provision it when the storage class came up, what availability zone am I gonna create that EBS volume in? I don't know because um, it has to match wherever nodes are gonna, whatever pod is gonna use it, that's where it needs to actually um, be provisioned to. So by setting volume boat, this binding mode, what happens is the sequence goes, um, when the pod gets created and consumes the persistent volume claim, then that point, you actually know what node that pod's running on, which means you know what availability zone that node's running on, which means this EBS provisioner knows which, uh, which, um, which availability zone to provision the EBS volume in. So long story short, if you didn't have this wait for first consumer, this probably would not work with EBS because it, you would never, you know, you're never going to get the right availability zone for your EBS volume. Okay, so I don't know if that made sense, but that's what this volume binding mode is. 
And that's why we had to do it, because we had to match availability zones between the data and the pod. Okay. Whew. Um, so now the persistent volume claim is basically identical to what we did earlier, except for now I'm just referring to it as EBSSC. That ties it back. So in this case, this string is actually, you know, first it looks for volumes that are already named this. It's not going to find any. So it's going to fall back to the storage, um, to the storage class, find it, and that's what's going to cause it to dynamically provision. And then the pod itself is exactly the same. I'm just mapping it exactly the same. So let's just see how this runs. If I do kube helm install dev storage class. Let's see what I need to do here. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna look at this. We're just gonna observe a couple things. Um, first thing I'm gonna observe is wait till things come up here. Okay, so it's still creating the container. Okay, it's running, which means everything should have come up now. So kube control get PV. So there is the PV. So this is now, I didn't remember, I didn't create the persistent volume this time. This persistent volume was automatically created by that storage class, right? And then, this, then the kube, kube control get pvc of course then this is now bound to that volume and if i was to go into here and if i refresh the screen i should see um, it's hard to tell which one it is but i believe it's this top one may 22nd at five yeah this top one right here this is the one that got created here that volume right here um this volume is the one that got created. Now, I don't know if I can tell it. I probably can't, but I'm curious now. Control, describe, PV. Let's see if there's anything in here that tells me. Oh, there it is right here. That volume, AE. It's probably this one right here. Yeah, it's that right there. So, right. So, you can actually tell what volume it is. It's in the... It's in the um, in the PV, it tells you how this got created and what's backing it, okay? Um, and then the only other thing I want to do here is illustrate that if I delete the PVC, so if I do kube control delete pod example, oh, I did want to show you one thing here. Yeah, okay, but, well, this is fine. I have to wait for this to finish. Okay, I'm going to pause the video, wait for this to delete, and I'm going to show you a couple things, and then we're done. Okay, okay I'm back. Um, okay, so what I want to show you before I did anything else, describe PV. Right. There should be, um, see this reclaim policy? By default, when you use a storage class, the reclaim policy is delete. So that means if I delete the PVC, right, then it should automatically delete the PV and then the backing data set. So let's just do that. So cube control delete data. Okay. When delete the PVC, that delete po the, re the retain policy should now get PV and there should be none, right? And if I go over here, that one I just highlighted, the AE one, it better go away. And it's no longer there, right? So that's how, and, and how storage class. So the beauty of this now is the infrastructure team doesn't need to now continually provision volumes for people. They, they can do it uh, by creating the storage class. They can have the developer automatically create these volumes on the fly. Okay, I think that's it for the video. Thank you.